Assalamu alaikum. This is Dr. Maryam Al Abdullah, a professor in orthodontics at the University of Jordan and the senior orthodontic consultant at the Jordan University Hospital. Uh, this lecture is going to be about orthodontic uh, assessment uh, first stage, which is the history taking and extraoral examination. Uh, our second lecture is going to be about intraoral examination, so both will have the same reference, which is chapter uh, five from uh, An Introduction to Orthodontics by Simon Littlewood and Laura Mitchell, fifth edition. So we're going to start with the history taking uh, and then extra oral examination that includes skeletal, soft tissue, uh, aesthetic smile, and timber mandibular joint examination. What are we trying to do? We're trying to reach a correct uh, diagnosis of the orthodontic problem. In order to do so, we need to collect data. We need to collect information. How? The first thing is by talking to the patient to take uh, certain history and certain information. And after that, we go into clinical examination, extraoral and intraoral examination. And based on the clinical examination, we can uh, take some records to aid our uh, diagnosis and help us with the uh, identification of problems. And this might include study models, photos, or radiographs. And after we collect all these sources of information, we need to analyze them. We need to come out with our problem list and reach a proper and correct diagnosis. And after that, we can build our uh, treatment plan accordingly. History taking, which is the interview, uh, should include the personal details, chief complaint, medical history, dental history, habits, physical growth status, motivation and expectations for the treatment, social and family history. But actually, the actual examination and collection of data starts right from the beginning. As the patient enters your dental office, you need to pay attention to lots of details, okay? Patient size, because this can tell you about the uh, height peak uh, velocity, uh, and you can compare his height to his parents, or if he's coming with uh, his brothers or sisters, you can compare his height, and you can guess the growth status that he's in. The color of the skin, is he pale? Are there any batches of, of abnormalities in his skin? Legions, structure and function of the craniofacial area or even of his uh, uh, different musculatures to look for any uh, sometimes learning difficulties or learning problems. Facial bones, of course, symmetry, ears, nose, eyes. You, you need to pay attention to lots of details from the moment uh, the patient enters your clinic. Personal details, of course, the patient's name and age. And for the age, it's important to record the patient's age in years and months. If they are younger than 20, uh, older than 20, well, it's enough to go for years. So you can say 22, 35, it's okay, it's fine. The patient is an adult, he stopped uh, growing. But if the patient, for example, is uh, 10 years of age, there is a big difference between a patient who is nine years and 10 months and the patient who is 10 years and 10 months from a dental development point of view, for example. So uh, young children, we need to record uh, the age in years and months because this will really affect our, uh, uh, you know, uh, guessing of the dental development and we need to compare the dental development to the patient's chronological age. Uh, if the patient is 17, this is different from, uh, for example, uh, 18 uh, and a half in terms of residual growth, in terms of planning for orthognathic surgery, etc. So the age is important to be recorded uh, accurately, especially patients younger than 20. So this table or, or box is from your chapter and it's uh, talking about the uh, information needed to be included in the history taking. Uh, patients complain, medical history, dental history, habits, physical growth status, patients motivation, as we said, and social behavior factors. Chief complaints should be recorded with the patient's own words. OK, don't put words into the patient's mouth. Don't suggest anything at this stage. You need to know exactly what is the patient's perception to the problem. What is the problem? 
Is it aesthetic? Is it functional? Is it a dental health problem related, for example, to a traumatic occlusion? Um, you need to know why is the patient seeking treatment now? Is it an internal motivation? Is the patient just really aware of the problem and they want, they are demanding treatment? Because this is good. An internal motivation is really good in terms of compliance, um, uh, being a regular attender to your clinic, um, follow the instructions. Uh, patients who have external motivation, which means that they are not really aware of the problem. They are not demanding treatment, but they are trying to satisfy someone else, like the parents or the partner, or sometimes the uh, dent the school dentist actually referred the patient to the uh, clinic and they're just seeking consultation because they are worried. They are not really uh, aware of the problem. So at this stage, it's important to know the type of motivation because it will give you a clue about patient's compliance and expectation. The patient's expectations should be realistic. If they are not realistic, then you need to actually sit down and spend some time with the patient to explain what is possible to be achieved with orthodontic treatment alone and what's not. And then you can actually educate the patient about uh, what uh, could be uh, realistically expected from the, at the end of the orthodontic treatment. Uh, chief complaint will affect your treatment options, of course, and it will affect the, the priority uh, of your problem list. Uh, a patient who comes to your clinic uh, where you ask him uh, what's the problem and they would say, I have a big mandible, is different from a patient who comes to your clinic and would say, OK, this upper tooth is actually rotated and I hate it. OK, so maybe both patients are having actually big mandible, but the first one is really uh, we need to get a consultation of the, or, or consultation from the surgical department uh, if our examination did confirm that the patient is having prognathic mandible, for example, or or a skeletal discrepancy. Um, and the other patient, if if they're having big mandible but the problem is not that uh, severe, we can actually overlook the problem and accept the skeletal discrepancy because the patient is not really concerned. Um, but if severe, we can educate the patient into uh, into the problem and of course get the patient's opinion uh, about the possible surgical intervention. So patients, again, patients' perception of the problem, their, their complaint will really affect your treatment options and your problem list. Medical history, of course, as any other dental patients, is important to protect yourself, uh, protect your staff, protect other patients, and of course, protect the patient uh, themselves. The patients themselves as uh, to take a certain treatment precautions as necessary. Uh, you can identify certain syndromes. Uh, uh, there are a number of syndromes that you can actually uh, look at that are uh, common uh, and important for orthodontic patients and number of medical history, medical histories or, or uh, conditions that could affect uh, our orthodontic treatments. And actually the table that was provided in your chapter, I thought it was uh, more relevant and more organized. So for example, the patient with epilepsy, uh, it's important to record this because this will affect your treatment plan because you, are, you cannot use removable appliances with patients of epilepsy. Uh, you cannot use headgear. Um, and some medication that these patients take actually affect their gingiva and it will cause hypertrophy and you might, you might end up having several uh, surgical uh, gingivectomy for these patients during your orthodontic treatment. Latex allergy, nickel allergy. Well, nickel allergy is, is relevant to us because we use uh, nickel titanium wires and other materials where nickel is part of it. Uh, sometimes we need to use alternatives. Uh, we need to check with the physician uh, and get consultation first. Diabetic patients, it's important to get this condition under control and maintain excellent oral hygiene. Um, heart defects with the risk of infective endocarditis, we need to look for the guidelines, especially those that get updated really frequently. We need to uh, consult with their physician. Uh, for such patients, we need to try to avoid extraction of teeth if possible. We need to, of course, uh, avoid using bands on molars and just use tubes. Um, uh, impacted teeth has uh, also, this is very important for such patients. Sometimes we go for extraction instead of 
uh, open exposure and traction because this is a lengthy procedure that could increase risk of problems for such patients, etc. Um, bleeding disorders, asthma, this fascinates, yes, patients with uh, osteoporosis sometimes take, take certain medication like the bisphosphonates. Uh, this medication could actually, um, uh, it will uh, slow down the turnover of bone um, and it, it will uh, reduce the uh, speed of tooth movement. It will slow tooth movement. Uh, we need to check with the physician. We need to check for alternative medications and um, and plan our treatment accordingly. Patients with learning difficulties of behavior disorders, uh, we need to make sure that the patient could actually uh, uh, follow instructions, maintain excellent oral hygiene. They can manipulate the appliance properly if it's removable. Uh, we can go for fix if, if the patient's uh, skills is not helping. Uh, to follow instructions, etc. So uh, again, this table will actually summarize the important medical conditions uh, and their relevance to orthodontics. Dental history will give you a clue if the patient is a regular has a regular attendance with his dentist. But this is good because it will uh, actually tells you that the patient has good compliance and he can actually be a regular attendant uh, to your clinic. Uh, you need to re uh, record uh, uh, any uh, previous extractions, root canal treatments, uh, previous history of traumas, uh, timbre mandibular joint problems. Um, you need to uh, record uh, any inherited dental problems in the family. Uh, for example, um, hyperdontia, impacted teeth, apex shaped laterals. Uh, small maxilla, big mandible, so this could be like uh, malocclusion problems. Previous orthodontic treatment, it's important to record this uh, because um, uh, it's important to know why was the previous treatment uh, unsuccessful. Um, what type of appliance the, 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 the patient had? How long did the previous orthodontic treatment last? Uh, this is important because um, it again it will give you a clue about the patient compliance and the problems uh, that the patient uh, was faced with in the, in, in, during his previous treatment. Any persistent habits or previous habits, especially thumb sucking habits and dummy sucking habits, uh, pacifiers, because these usually can uh, contribute to the development of malocclusion. Nail biting uh, is an important habit to report because it will uh, increase risk of root reduction during orthodontic treatment. Physical growth status, as we said, as the patient comes into your clinic, it's important to assess their height stature. Um, of course, chronological age is, re is uh, recorded and you need to compare this with the dental age. Dental age could be assessed clinically by intraoral examination and this could be assessed through uh, the use of a panorama, uh, orthobantogram, because it will uh, give you information about the stage of root formation. Uh, height, as we said, uh, patient's height, which is the best indicator of growth uh, spurt. General physical maturation, uh, growth charts, you can consult with the pediatrician and get a copy of the growth charts in order to look at the patient's progress and to compare the patient with, uh, with the other uh, children of the same age. Hand wrist radiograph uh, is not uh, ordered by orthodontist anymore. Um, it is used by some pediatricians, so if it's there, we can use it. We can uh, assess the skeletal uh, maturation and the stage of development. Uh, otherwise, if the patient, from an orthodontic point of view, needed a cephalogram uh, to complete his diagnosis, then we can use what we call cervical maturation. Cervical maturation is to look at the shape and the lower border of the cervical vertebrae, uh, and we can actually stage the maturation into different stages, and we can assess the growth, uh, craniofacial growth stage for the patient. Why is this important? Because um, rapid growth during adolescence growth spurt will facilitate tooth movement, right, and uh, growth modification 
uh, is possible if the patient uh, attended your clinic during his growth spurt. And it's not really an option if the patient is beyond uh, the growth spurt. Uh, so again, this will affect your uh, treatment plan and the uh, appliance that you're going to be using. Social and family history, it's important to know where the patient is living because this will affect his uh, attendance to your clinic. We need to see the patient every four to eight weeks. Uh, as I said, we need to look at family history of dental anomalies, family histories of malocclusion. Uh, some types of malocclusions can run in families, for example, patients with long faces and anterior open bite, patients with the prognathic mandible. Um, uh, these type of malocclusions can actually be inherited. Right, so uh, after we finish taking uh, the uh, uh, history and details from the patient, we will start to wear our gloves and we start to ask the patient to be properly seated on the dental chair, right? Uh, if, we do, if we do so, what happens is that we're going to lose this relaxed uh, period, a uh, few minutes where we were asking the patient different questions and the patient is not really realizing that you're doing uh, examination of other stuff. And uh, if the patient becomes stressed because you're going to start his examination, you're going to lose the, the, the uh, possibility to properly um, detect the lip competency, for example. Lip competency is uh, the, uh, uh, the behavior of uh, muscular activity of the lips at rest. Uh, when the patient is upright at the natural hip position, upper and lower lips should meet at rest. We call this competent lips, okay? Uh, if the patient is tense, he can actually force his lips together. Uh, so it's important uh, while you're asking the patient's name and age, you check for lip competency, you check for learning difficulties, as we said, syndrome, facial asymmetry, upper central line, facial height, uh, teeth showing on smiling, teeth showing at rest, also um, important information that you can actually get before you uh, start the proper uh, clinical examination. And these can be confirmed during the interview and during the uh, clinical examination. So uh, the clinical examination in three dimensions is divided into extraoral and intraoral. Today we're going to finish the extraoral examination in three dimensions. First of all, the skeletal pattern in the anterior posterior, in the vertical and in the transverse dimension. If we look at the patient's lateral view, his profile, we can get uh, information about the anterior posterior skeletal pattern and the vertical skeletal pattern. If we look from the frontal view, if we face the patient and we look at the frontal view, we can get information about the transverse skeletal pattern and the vertical skeletal pattern. It's important to seat the patient upright and in the natural head position. And of course, after that, we need to look for soft tissues, lip competency, lip morphology, fullness, um, and um, an isolated angle, resting lower lip line, tongue and uh, swallowing patterns, a smile aesthetics, and temporomandibular trim. The skeletal pattern in the anterior posterior uh, dimension could be assessed in three ways the use of A point, B point, the use of facial convexity, and the zero meridian line. A point, B point, according to the definition, is the same as uh, those that we use for cephalometric analysis. A point is the deepest concavity of the anterior surface of the maxilla within the sagittal plane. B point is the deepest concavity of the anterior surface of the mandible within the sagittal plane. And here we're talking about soft tissue points. Normally, A point should be ahead of B point two to four millimeters to call this a class one. How do we assess the A point and B point? There are three ways to assess A point and B point. We use our index finger and middle finger and we uh, try to reach intraorally to reach the A point and B point, or we can do this by extraorally reaching A point, soft tissue A point and B point. If our index finger and um, middle finger are both are held parallel to the horizon, that means we have a class one uh, skeletal pattern. If we have to tilt both fingers, downward, that means we have class three. If we have to tilt both fingers upward, that means this is a class two, okay? 
upward, that means we're trying to reach the, the, the B point. So this is a class two. Or the third way to do it is just to look at the patient, patient profile, uh, look at the A point and B point, and on average, check how far is A point is ahead of B point, okay? It should be two to four millimeters. So this is a mild class three skeletal pattern. So class one is when the A point is ahead of B point two to four millimeters, class two if it's more than that, and class three if it's less than that. So this is a class one. This is a class one, but the patient is actually tilting his head. This is not a natural head position. He's tilting his head upward, but A point is ahead of B point two to four. So this is the class one. This patient has a class one. Here it's more than two to four. So this is a class two. Here is more obvious class two. This is a class three, and this is a class three skeletal pattern. Now we come to the convexity of the face. Uh, and here we look at the angle between two lines, a line that represent the middle face and another one that represent the lower face. And our reference points are the glabella between the eyebrows, the subnasale, and the uh, pogonian. Okay, so if these three points are going, are forming a convex shape, then this means that we have class two skeletal pattern with convex profile. If we have mild convexity or straight line, that means we have class one skeletal pattern. If it's a concave shape, that means we have class three skeletal pattern with a concave profile. Zero meridian line is a line that is drawn perpendicular from soft tissue nasian to the Frankfurt plane. Soft tissue nasian is the deepest part of the bridge of the nose, okay? is the deepest part of the bridge of the nose. It's not a glabella, glabella is between the eyebrows. Nasian is the deepest part of the bridge of the nose. We drop a line that is perpendicular to the Frankfurt plane. Frankfurt plane is a line between the lower border of the uh, orbit and the upper part of the tragus, okay? This line, if we drop it, Bougonian, soft tissue Bougonian should pass through this line like here, like here. So this is an average anterior posterior position of the mandible. Here we have a retrognathic mandible, and this case here we have prognathic mandible. Now we come to the skeletal pattern in the vertical dimensions, and we can assess this by two ways, linear assessment or angular assessment. Linear assessment by looking at the proportions of the face. We look at the upper facial height, middle facial height, and lower facial height, okay? How do we do this? We divide the, the uh, face into three thirds, uh, starting from the hairline to the glabella, from the glabella to the subnasale, from the subnasale to the minton. Minton is the most, uh, the lowest part of the uh, symphysis or the chin. These three areas or three thirds should be uh, plus minus equal. Okay, and if we go to the lower anterior lower facial height and we draw a line representing the vermilion border uh, of the upper and the lower lip, then this should result in um, uh, one third occupied by the upper lip, two thirds occupied by the lower lip and the chin. So this is a nicely proportioned face. So again, we have three thirds and then uh, the vermilion border should divide the lower facial height into upper lip occupying one third, lower lip and chin occupying two thirds. So this is a well proportioned Face. So middle facial height, lower facial height should be 50-50, almost equal. And this is showing you a patient with a short upper lip because the upper lip is occupying less than one third of the lower facial height. Average upper lip and increased length of upper lip because this occupies almost half of the lower facial height. This is a patient who is presented with an average lower facial height compared to the mid face. So these are almost equal. And the patient who is presented with an increased lower facial height compared to the mid face. And this is a patient who presented with a reduced lower facial height, reduced. The other way to assess the skeletal pattern in the vertical dimension, as we said, is to look for uh, angular assessment. And here we look at the Frankfurt mandibular plane angle. Frankfurt plane, as we said, is the is, uh, connect the uh, a point that represents the lower border of the orbit and the upper part of the tragus. 
and then a line that represents the lower border of the mandible. If we extend both lines, on average, they should meet at the occipita. The occipita is the back of the head here. If these two lines meet at the occipita, that means the patient has average growth rotation, average Frankfurt mandibular plane angle. If they meet a head in front of the occipita here, then this patient uh, has an increased Frankfurt mandibular plane angle with posterior growth rotation. If both lines meet behind the occipita, that means the patient has a um, uh, reduced uh, Frankfurt mandibular plane angle with anterior growth rotation. Facial symmetry here, we need to look at uh, the frontal view of the patient and we can look at the um, we can look down the face from backward and uh, from behind the patient, okay? So we try to look at a line that represents the midline, taking into consider consideration the general symmetry of the face. We look, we look at the eyebrows, we look at the eyes, we look at the cheeks, uh, the vermilion, bo vermilion um, uh, border between both lips, uh, usually perpendicular to this line. Um, uh, philtrum of the upper lip, uh, the nose, well, but be careful, some patients will have deviation of the nose. Okay, so we look at the general symmetry of the face. As you can see here, we have um, a beautifully symmetrical face. For this patient here, there's a problem with the chin, and uh, the chin is deviating to the right. Okay, again, this patient has um, facial asymmetry with the chin deviating to the right. We can also look at the frontal view and use six lines to divide the face. Two lines that represent the outer border of the um, ears, and then two lines that represent the outer uh, border of the uh, left eye and the inner border of the left eye, and then the outer border of the right eye and the inner border of the right eye. And these six lines will divide the face into five fifths. Uh, plus minus, they should be equal, and they are all equal to the width of the eye. Okay. Right. Smile aesthetics is another thing to look at during extraoral examination. During full smiling, the patient should fall, should show full clinical length, full clinical length of the crowns of the upper incisors. Okay. For females, one to two millimeter of gingiva show on full smiling is still considered aesthetic and still considered normal. Also, the uh, lower border of the incisors on full smiling should follow the curvature of the lower lip. They should follow the smile arc, okay? Uh, but yet they should not be in touch with the lower lip. So the smile arc is a normal smile arc where we have a certain curvature that follow the curvature of the lower lip on full smiling or a straight smile, which is sometimes acceptable, or sometimes we can have reversed the smile arc, reverse. Um, the gingival margin of the upper incisors, the centrals and the uh, canines, the gingival margin should be almost equal. For the lateral, the gingival margin is usually one millimeter more incisory compared to the centrals and the uh, canines. Now, in terms of transverse width of the smile, teeth should fill the mouth. We will have minimal black corridor on both corners. Um, now, narrower smile will actually cause black corridor, which is sometimes considered unesthetic. The dental uh, arrangement should be symmetrical, and the midline of the uh, upper and lower incisor should be within the midline of the face. Having said so about the smile aesthetics, an orthodontic treatment alone sometimes is not enough to, to achieve this. Sometimes we need to go for uh, surgical consultation and procedures, periodontal uh, procedures or restorative procedures. So a patient with gummy smile due to, for example, maxillary excess, vertical maxillary excess, sometimes we need to go for surgical impaction of the maxilla. Uh, a patient with uh, short clinical crowns and overgrowth of the gingiva, sometimes we need to go for gingivectomy. Uh, patients with um, uh, certain uh, problems with the shape of their teeth, size of the teeth, sometimes we can go for restorative treatment. So sometimes orthodontic alone is not enough to achieve the optimal smile aesthetic. 
Now, soft tissues, we need to look at lips and tongue. For the lips, lips competency, as we said, is when the, when the lips uh, meet at rest when the patient is, is in the upright natural head position. So here we have competent lips. Sometimes the lips are competent, but there is an obstacle that are preventing them from coming together. Like here, for example, we have the upper incisors proclined and it's coming between the upper and the lower lip. We call this potentially competent lips. Sometimes the problem is short lip or high lower facial height, other problems that will cause the upper and the lower uh, lips to be separated at rest uh, considerably. And this is what we call incompetent lips. Incompetent lips. By the way, if the lips at rest are separated one to two millimeters, still this is considered normal. One to two millimeter of separation of the lips at rest is still considered normal. And we still say that this is, these are competent lips. Um, now, uh, at younger ages, uh, if the lips are incompetent, uh, this might be affected later on with the growth. Uh, and it could get worse if we have unfavorable vertical growth, or it get, can get better if we have a favorable soft tissue growth and maturation. So sometimes we wait uh, for uh, soft tissue maturation in order to assess the competency of the lips. Uh, lip competency is very important, especially for patients with a class 2 division 1 because if you are aiming during treatment to reduce the overjet, then the stability of, at the end of the result will depend on the competency of the lips. You need to uh, correct uh, the incompetent lips into competent lips in order to uh, aid and increase stability of the results at the end of the treatment. Uh, lips morphology, form, tonicity and fullness uh, really will be affected by the ethnicity of the patient. On average, the lips should be slightly averted uh, at the base and some vermilion border should be seen at rest. Uh, for uh, Afro-Caribbean uh, patients, uh, more protrusion of the lips is considered normal. For Caucasian uh, patients, uh, less protrusive is considered normal. We can use the uh, Ricketts E-plane in order to assess soft tissues. And as you can remember, it's a line that connects the tip of the nose with the tip of the chin. And the lower lip should be ahead of this line, about two millimeters, and the upper lip should be at or slightly behind this line um, to assess the aesthetic and the protrusion of the lips. Nasolabial angle is the angle between the base of the nose and the upper lip and it is affected by both. It is affected by the morphology of the nose and it's affected by the lip itself, the protrusion of the lips. And the protrusion of the lips is affected by the soft tissue thickness, is affected by the tonicity, the fullness, and is affected by the position of the upper incisors. So if the nose morphology is normal and the upper incisors are proclined, you can see some protrusion of the lips and a reduced nasolabial angle. Uh, if, the, if the nasal morphology is normal and the upper incisors are retroclined, you can have less retrusion of the lips with an increased nasolabial angle. So this is an example of a patient with a reduced nasolabial angle, almost average 110. Uh, the average is 90 to 110, and this is very much increased nasolabial angle. The lower lip line is assessed when the patient again in the upright position, natural head position, and you ask the patient to rest his lips and you lift up the upper lip slightly and you look to the lower lip and how much it covers the upper incisors. On average, the lower lip line should cover about one third of the upper incisors at rest. If it's covering more, that means we have a high lower lip line. So if the up, if the if like, like for example here, the lower lip covers more than half of the upper incisor. This is high lower lip line. If it covers less than that, this is a low lower lip line. Other terminology is important during extra oral examination for the lips is what we call lip trap. And lip trap is when the lower lip is trapped behind the upper incisors due to increased over uh, jet. Uh, for, for some cases. Uh, Strap-like lower lip are cases where they have a very strong um, uh, strong musculature of the lower lip uh, with high tonicity. 
uh, and this uh, this high tonicity will affect the position of the incisors. So if the patient has a strap-like lower lip with low lower lip line, then mainly the effect of the lower lip will be on the lower incisors, and we will end up with an upright to retroclined lower incisors and increased over depth. So the patient usually gets class two division one type of malocclusion. If the patient has strap-like lower lip with average to high lower lip line, then you will end up with a retroclination of the upper incisors. If it's severe, you will get retroclination of both upper and lower incisors. Now we come to tongue and swallowing pattern. There are four types of swallowing pattern. Competent lips swallowing pattern, incompetent lips forced together swallowing pattern, lower lip to tongue swallowing pattern, what we call the lip trap uh, associated with incomplete overbite, and tongue thrust or tongue to lips swallowing pattern. Tongue thrust is two types. And it's very important to differentiate between them. Uh, it's important, yes, but it's very difficult. There are two types of tongue thrust, endogenous and exogenous, or what we call ad adaptive. The endogenous tongue thrust is very rare, and this is good because it's difficult to treat, and there is a high tendency of relapse because the problem and the etiology is the tongue, and you cannot actually treat it with, uh, with or simply with the orthodontic treatment. Usually these patients will have uh, very um, specific and classical features. They will have macroglossia, lisping, they will have proclined upper and lower incisors, anterior open bite, indentation of teeth, indentation of teeth on the tongue, and a reverse curve of speed. At rest, the tongue is usually resting between the incisors. At rest, you can see the patient is smiling, the patient is, is at rest, the tongue is always there. So this is endogenous tongue thrust. Exogenous tongue thrust or adapted tongue thrust is more common, easier to treat, and with better stability at the end of the treatment, and usually it is a result of the malocclusion. Usually the patient is presented with an anterior open bite, and the tongue is needed to be positioned forward in order to achieve an anterior oral, oral seal during swallowing. Thank okay. you. Now, finally, we come to the timbromandibular joint, okay? It's important to ask the patient about any symptoms related to this joint. We place our middle finger over the condylar head while the patient is asked to open and close and to go uh, to both sides, you know, lateral movement and, and uh, uh, protrusion of the mandible. It's important to note any signs of pathology. Uh, for example, tenderness, clicks, crepitus, blocking of the joint. Um, you need to record range of movements and maximum opening. Um, although there is no strong evidence that the malocclusion can cause similar mandibular joint problems, and although also there is no strong evidence to prove that orthodontic treatment will uh, heal uh, and uh, treat uh, similar mandibular joint problems, uh, yet, it's an important aspect to be recorded, and if necessary, we can uh, consult uh, the specialist, uh, timber and joint specialist, in, or before any orthodontic treatment uh, is carried out, but because we cannot uh, carry out such treatment with an, uh, with, where we have a persistent and an active timber and joint problem. Uh, right, so this is the history taking and extraoral examination. Uh, including all this, uh, these titles, uh, and our next lecture is going to be on intraoral examination. Thank you for listening.